Thank you for being here this afternoon for our latest edition of our interviews with our leadership team at Lutheran Social Ministries of Maryland. And I want to introduce uh, Mrs. Susie Dyer Gear, our Vice President of Human Resources. And so Susie and I are going to jump right in. And, and as we've talked about in the past, we touch on some personal uh, questions as well as some professional questions. So we will go all over the spectrum today and, and see where Susie leads us and if she uh, answers in a particular way that gives me another avenue, I'll keep going. So first off, I'd like to again thank you for agreeing to, to do this interview. I know sometimes it's, it's challenging. No, thank you. Look forward to it. So we'll start off with an easy one for you. So please tell us about your family. Ah, well, I grew up in Western Maryland in a small town, Cumberland, some of you might um, know it, and I'm one of five girls. So my parents had five children, four daughters, um, five daughters, I was the designated tomboy, so we had four, and then I was sort of the dumb job of the family. Um, my mother is going to be 89 in just a couple of weeks, and she lives in her own home, still in Cumberland. I have two sisters in Cumberland, one in Charleston, South Carolina, and one in Mesa, Arizona. And my father passed away more than 30 years now. Okay. And I understand you're married. I, yeah, that part of my family. A wonderful family. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit how you met your husband. Ah, I do. I um, married to Spence, and we've been married 38 years now. We have two sons. Matthew is 33, and Andrew is 29. Um, and they both live in the Baltimore, Washington area um, as well. So how I met Spence is sort of a long story. Um, the short answer is we met in a psychiatric hospital. The longer answer is that uh, my husband, Spence, was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, born and raised, and he came over here um, in 1977 to do his Master's of Social Work graduate program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And he chose Baltimore, he had a family connection. Um, so Spence's father, my father-in-law, was a fairly famous um, virologist, infectious disease expert, some sort of thing, Dr. Fauci in South Africa. And he was the head of South African Institute on Poliomyelitis. So he spent a lot of time over in the States um, working with not actually South Africa's team so much, but with the U.S. team um, on a polio vaccine. And so he made lots of friends, including a very close friend in Baltimore um, and his family. So Spence chose to come over here when he was in his graduate program. Um, he did a year-long sort of internship in Cumberland, Maryland at a psychiatric hospital there. And after he graduated, they offered him a job and he worked, interestingly enough, as a geriatric social worker, his first job out of graduate school. Um, I went to school undergrad in Tennessee. And when I came back, I got my first job in the same hospital as a alcoholism and substance abuse counselor. So we met in the psychiatric hospital. Now, I'm sure everybody that, that is, is watching this is thinking the same thing I am, that when you first hear that, you oh, start yeah. to wonder, why were you in psychiatric oh, hospital? Exactly. So, People who know us, like, really say, oh, were you, were you working? Yes, we were actually working. It's a great story. It though. is a great <laughs> story. So I, I can't let you off the hook. We, we passed over Cumberland, Maryland, and, and you mentioned it a few times, and uh, I know many of, of our uh, watchers here today may be familiar with it, but maybe you could share a little bit about your hometown. Sure. Um, it's a beautiful hometown in the mountains um, of Western Maryland. So one interesting thing about Cumberland, it is in a deep valley, and because of that, we didn't have television reception or much at all growing up, but we were one of the first in the nation to pilot HBO. So growing up, I thought everyone had HBO, and so when I was a teenager, we had, it's like, you know, and years later, people say, oh yeah, HBO, I said, I've had that, you know, for 20 years. So, um, but a wonderful small town to grow up in, um, and some of you might be familiar with Deep Creek Lake, so that was about a, an hour away. And the interesting thing about Cumberland, too, is that even though it was two hours away from both Baltimore and D.C., it was very sort of connected 
to them in that when spence and i were dating and first married we would think nothing of going on a school night or work night drive down to a game and then come back and go to work the next day for the oriole game or go to theater or something in dc and then drive back and go to work the next day it's not like two hours was nothing you know i have to go back to hbo just for a second because that brings a lot of nostalgia for for me i know as as a kid that was a big deal to have hbo and didn't always have it of course and so I'm very jealous, I have to admit. Nowadays, I'm sure, uh, whether it's my kids or anybody else that's younger, may not have that reference point. But that was now, great. mind you, we had it on a very small television <laughs> in a course. giant console that weighed a you know, 600 pound piece of furniture that had a small television. With no HD, right? No, 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 no high definition, of course not. No remote, are you kidding? <laughs> right. my, my father, we uh, grew up in a, a five bedroom house. Tried to explain the three channels going to four channels, and, okay. and it was minds were blown yeah. in those moments. So yeah. I, I can't imagine having HBO as a child. So very it's fortunate. A, it was nice. <laughs> so do you have any pets? We do. We have um, one dog now. Macy is a 13-year-old lab mix, and she was found in a box on the side of the road in Elon, North Carolina. Um, a friend of the family was going to college there in Elon, and somebody found it, and she ended up with her in, in her um, dorm room, and thought maybe there the gears would take her and come in Westminster for some reason. So, so that's how we got Macy, and we tried to take Macy for a long walk along the road every evening, and some evenings we sort of drag her, but most weekends we try to take her to a local park. Hoshua, um, Camp Hoshua, if you know that. And she literally drags us up hills, like steep hills at age 13. She loves it so much, just acts like a puppy there. That is great. Have you always had pets? Um, we had, growing up, I had cats, no dogs. And this is the third dog that we've had, two vestues and another chocolate. That was our first one. And our kids were little. And I said, I, you know, I didn't grow up with dogs. I'm afraid of some of them. And I, you know, a bunch of a ha big hassle, and the kids won't take care of them. And my husband looked at me and Spence said, do you want your children to be afraid of dogs like you? I know. And I looked down, and then we had dogs. So always had one since then. Gotcha, gotcha. So where do you live now? You mentioned Hashimoto, which means right. that probably gives a clue. Yes, we live sure. in Westminster, um, just outside Westminster. If you're familiar with off of 140, um, the road before, or a couple roads before, Bonkers Orchard. So I um, lived there for 38 years. If I had a good arm, we could almost throw a baseball and, and hit the orchard. So do you qualify as, as a, a long-term? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not in Carol. I don't, don't want to offend anybody. My great-grandparents didn't live here, so not quite as you know, local. But our kids both grew up and went to public school here. So they're considered locals. Almost, I think. Almost. Almost. So where did you go to college? Um, I went two years. Growing up in Cumberland, I went two years to Allegheny Community College. And then I transferred to the University of Tennessee. And why in the world did I go to Tennessee from home there? Not for any great academic reason, I'm afraid. We, uh, I had a friend in community college, and we went down to Gatlinburg, um, which is outside by now, outside of Knoxville. And we worked um, and stayed with her uncle. So her uncle was head of safety and security of Smoky Mountain National Park. He had a little apartment with the house, and so we stayed there, and we waitressed for two years there, and, um, and fell in love with Tennessee. So we went to, went to Knoxville, Tennessee, graduated from there with a bachelor's degree in psychology, and then um, several years later got a master's degree from Johns Hopkins. Now, I'm shocked that you're not here in Orange. <laughs> if, I, if 
I would have been a betting man, I, I would have put down money on an orange, an orange suit the day because yeah. I'll tell you, which I have one. <laughs> yeah, if you ever go by Susie's office, there's something orange just about everywhere, and uh, pretty much every meeting you go to, something orange comes along with you. Yeah, and um, and you should see there. my house. Um, Tennessee's colors are orange and white, and I have an, um, an unusual fascination with with orange. My husband resisted um, me like actually painting the walls orange, so we, we have a lot of orange accents in the house. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'll share this. Um, between myself, Steve Powell, and, and Susie, we all have orange in our college colors, but I can tell you that um, most of these things have the wrong orange. Oh. So, <laughs> just, just the so Tennessee I'm, orange is the happiest color of all. Yes, I understand that. When you lose at football, like, you, you have to look forward to something else. Well, Janet, too. So Janet has the ugly burnt orange out of Texas. True, true, <laughs> true, true. Um, so why did you decide to work at Lisbon Social Ministries in Maryland? Well, it was interesting. At the time, I um, so I've been in human resources well over 30 years. And at the time, I had a consulting firm, an HR and organizational development consulting firm that I've been doing for probably about 12 years. And um, with a dear friend of mine who is a psychologist who does organizational work. And um, at the time, we had a subcommittee of the Board of Trustees um, called the HR Committee. And it included members of the board, but also um, members of the community, so HR professionals in the community, and a person on this, on the committee, who I had taught in graduate school, and then my husband hired, I mean, my husband hired her, which was right move, by the way, um, she contacted me and she said, hey, you haven't applied for the job at CLB. And I said, I, I have a job that I'm very happy at and really not interested. So long story short, she's talked me into speaking to um, Gary Milliken at the time, who I sort of knew because our friends, our kids were friends in, um, in grade school. So I, I knew he and his wife Nancy um, with the kids. And so I came to speak to him and, um, and I, you know, I didn't think I wanted to join an organization again, but I, I was really attracted to the mission um, focus, the mission base, and, and just everybody was so friendly. I came for lunch, and I refer to it as a three-hour tour, because truly I think I met almost everyone. And you can get a feel of an organization by walking around and saying hi to people. And, um, and I decided I wanted to be part of something like that again. So as the Vice President of Human Resources, what have you been focused on the most in 2021? So, um, like most of us, over the last, what, year and a half or so, COVID has been a, a big part of it. And truly, every department, not just healthcare, but every department has been focused, I think, on that. Um, in HR, we were uh, concerned about it helping with communication. So, weekly communication that went out to, to team, member, team members. We did a lot of research on how to handle things, what are best practices. Um, when we decided to, quite frankly, be one of the first organizations in our field and maybe in the nation to mandate vaccines back in making the decision in December of 2020, we did a lot of legal research and spoke to legal counsel and wrote policies and things. So um, really focused on that. Um, the other thing, and as you know, Jeff, um, and I must warn you, when uh, we were speaking with Jeff just a few minutes ago for our Core Value VIP Award, um, Anna Magnabo, our HR director, just told Jeff that just ask Susie about the core values and she'll speak for 45 minutes without stopping, which, which is sort of true. Um, but during the pandemic, we continued with initiatives, and one of those, as, as many of you, um, no, was our mission, vision, and core values, and involving every stakeholder, taking what nine months really to do it, I think. So, um, involving everyone, getting feedback from truly all the stakeholders and everyone in the organization, and, and making that become a reality. So, in 2020 and into 2021, our team has worked to, to weave all of those values into everything that a team member touches. So into the application process, into the interviewing, into performance evaluation, um, into 
really everything about it, so we've worked, we've worked hard with that. Now, I know you've sort of answered this next question and, and answering this last one, but how would you describe your role as Vice President of Human Resources? I, I know you touched on many points of what you're doing now, and, and I'm sure people can infer, but perhaps you can give an overview of, of your general role. Uh, will do. Well, I, I lead a small team of HR professionals. I mentioned Anna McNabow is our director of HR. Um, Allison Jacobs is the HR business partner at LVMG. Um, Cassie Altman is our HR coordinator here at um, COV, and we are currently recruiting for a director of talent acquisition. So um, I lead a team, and you know, when, um, when I looked at this question, I really thought, okay, so what do we do? And at its essence, our job is to help make CLV, LSMP, uh, a place that we can recruit good team members and hire good team members and keep good team members to best serve and care for residents. And so uh, to do that, that involves a lot of things. So it's first making sure that our compensation is where it should be, that we're um, offering competitive wages. So that means wage surveys and keeping on top of what others are paying, making sure our benefits are the best possible benefits that we can afford at the lowest cost that we can uh, offer to team members. And our benefits are really good. And for folks who don't know our benefits, we offer you know, health and dental vision. We pay the full premium for short-term disability, which is huge because we have a primarily female workforce of child-bearing years. And so having that short-term disability insurance is great. Long-term disability. Um, health, uh, life insurance, I'm sorry, and vacation and paid sick leave. So making sure our benefits are competitive and, and offered at a price that, um, that they can afford. And the other thing is helping to make CLV and LSMP a great place to work because that's going to, that sometimes trumps wages and benefits it's being someplace that people want to come and have a great reputation for in the community and then want to stay. So, so with that, one of the initiatives I didn't mention that we did in 2020, we had a task force with operations and HR and, and several others, and we completely revamped what was new employer orientation, and now it's new team member welcome. And it's two days rather than one. Um, new team members visit both communities, and it was done really to retain people. So. So that is sort of our, I think, what our real focus and our purpose is. Yeah, and I hope what everyone is hearing is that there's a lot of uh, behind closed doors work that occurs and, and uh, being part of many of those meetings, mm -hmm. I know that oftentimes we're on the phone with uh, third party vendors and, and talking through different uh, benefits that, that will hopefully uh, make our, the lives of our team members better in some right. way. Um, but also attract those new team members as we go and retain them. And, and I think you know, for most people, you may not know what kind of challenge it is to attract new talent these days. And, and I do consider uh, all of our team members' talent, regardless of their positions, is very important that they're treated that way and feel that way. And part of it is that benefits package. And I'll tell you, as, as time goes by, it's getting harder and harder to identify what matters most of the time. And I, I think that's um, going to be an ongoing challenge for this organization, and is, as it is for many. Um, I, I think uh, you, you probably picked up a little bit of a, a generation uh, conversation earlier between Susie and I talking about HBO. Uh, but I would also say that about benefits. So things that are likely important to Susie and I today may not be as important to our 25-year-old coming in the door. And so, uh, we need to be flexible enough that, that we can consider those other options and, and still make it affordable for folks. And, um, and I will say that our goal is to get as many people insured as we can. Yes. We, we certainly want our team to be healthy, and that's, that's critical for all of us uh, to be successful here. So um, I, you know, I want to congratulate Susie and her team because they do the, the heavy lifting in that work. But um, 
I can tell you that it, it's ongoing um, and it takes a lot of time. I think sometimes when people think of HR, they may think of that person you go to when you have a challenge at work. And, and it is. Right? And certainly there's that role. Um, but I will tell you, most of the time it's spent doing those other things that Susie mentioned and those great initiatives that, that uh, we're developing. So uh, excited about all of those things. So I want to talk a little bit. Well, actually, if I can I just sure. add to that a little bit, that, um, that it is. So employee relations or team member relations, because we are team members now, um, that's a big part of it as well. And making sure that we do things fairly. And, and not that we would ever not do things fairly, but there's a lot of gray area. So, you know, we have a, a team member has concerns, so we help them work through that. And we always want to do that. Um, but also talking about younger team members and what they might want, uh, we know from research that people who come to us uh, want to know how they can grow how they can advance their career, how they can learn all that they want in their career. And that's a big thing for not only to attract, but also to retain. And uh, so a shout out and a thank you to all residents who have contributed over the years to our team member scholarship fund. That is a great um, recruitment and a retention. And, and I know I say it, I you know hope one day we'll, we'll go back to be have have the scholarship receptions in July and have that celebration. But um, for those of you who've been there, every year I talk about the lives that are changed. And I am not exaggerating. It's just incredible that you know people who say, all my life I wanted to be a GNA, but I could never afford um, to go to school, and now you can. Or a GNA who says, I've always wanted to be a nurse, but there's no way I can afford it. And then it happens. And just the success stories that we have, um, not only does it help with recruitment and retention, but just makes us a better place. There, there are many uh, conversations Susie and I have about um, successes that I would describe them of, of team members who, who came to us in one role and have advanced through the organization. And um, some of our residents may be very aware of them, but I, I can tell you there, there are a lot across both communities, across uh, Lutheran social ministries. And so I'm very proud of that as an organization. I, I think that's a marker of a good organization uh, to be able to allow people to grow and experience things. And I, I think the other component of this, and this may sound strange after me sharing how much of a talent war we're in, um, we also understand that as we help our team achieve new skill levels, that at times there may not be a place for that individual for just the fact that we're, we're smaller. We yeah. might be small or mighty, as I would put it, small and mighty. Um, so we may at times lose a person, but what we also experience is that boomerang effect. Yeah. We've had people that leave us and then eventually they come back because that experience is good. And so it, it's really a couple different paths. Um, we certainly want the experience to be good while that person is here. We also want to give them the tools to grow. It's not a bad thing to see that person grow up and hopefully say great things about us as they leave. So, um, and we hope to come back someday. Um, and then have more So, um, very exciting. So, I, I know we talked about a few initiatives, but some of those were in the past or ongoing. So, talk to me a little bit about two or three initiatives you'd like to accomplish over the next year and beyond. Well, um, talking about the core values, again, stop me after 45 minutes, but that is something that I think is probably going to be the most important thing, maybe as we as an organization do over the next few years. Um, so we've been working on that this year and honestly for the, probably the next five years. So the goal is while we have the core values, and I mentioned the VIP awards, so, so we have quarterly awards that residents can nominate people, co-workers can nominate people, and we had just a wonderful celebration today of a nurse, an LPN um, at Carol Luther Village. And so we want to, not, so we have the core values, we train um, at new team member welcome, we speak about them in, in great detail. So this year, what we really want to do is, and we've woven them into HR things, we want 
everyone to live and breathe them. And when we say, okay, so these are important, really just getting that, having the supervisors, having the directors, having more and more do that and speak the language of team member rather than employee. Like, what's the big deal? It's all of it together is a big deal. And, um, and not that we don't treat people with respect, but just having that be a, um, a touch point. It's like, that was very respectful of you. Or, you know what, that didn't feel so respectful to, to me. So having those conversations and weaving those in, and that's truly a several year thing. Um, and I'll just say that consistency in, in the words we choose matters, right? Yeah. Uh, we want to understand where each of us are coming from and, and understand what the, the collective goal is. And so I think that universal language that, that we're all trying to speak helps. And, and at times, um, I'll use the word uh, community, for example. I hear facility a lot of times. And right. to me, facility conjures a lot of different things in my mind. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it'd be better to be a community. And so we need to talk about those things. And it may seem subtle, uh, but I, I think it does uh, enhance the space. It also allows us to know where we're trying, what we're trying to achieve um, from a big picture perspective. And, um, and some of that may, some of that nuance may seem um, small in the minds of many folks, but I can tell you it's important to developing that culture overall. So all, all that work that, that you're doing on that matters quite a bit. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, we were having, um, in my team, we were having a discussion this morning um, about that, not necessarily HR related, but food service versus culinary, or food service versus dining services. And, and for years, we just said, oh, they work in food service. Well, I would much rather dine in a culinary or a dining service than, than think of food service. So to your point, um, it, it matters just having a more positive thing. And so in our, we have a payroll and HR information system, so our computer system. So what we are doing is, and you know, just that field of food service, we're changing to culinary. And so people's badges, when we refer to each other, we have a culinary team member or a dining services team member. So it, I think it does make a difference. Yeah, I want to be a culinary. I know. <laughs> Well, I think to that point, um, you know, when you speak about culinary services, we want to give people a career. And so you want to talk about those paths and how they can accomplish that. And, and certainly food service does bring a lot of things to mind. Um, and again, some of it may be age, age for all of us that we, we conjure different things. But um, for me, I want to, by use of names and the appropriate names, paint a picture of what they may expect, but also where they can go. And, and you know, I want them to be proud. I want the team to be proud of whatever uh, role they play within the organization. And so, um, again, words matter, names matter, so. Great, no, and team member, you know, I want to be on a team. I want to be a team member as opposed to nothing wrong with employees, but I think it conjures up something, something more positive. Well, and I think to that point, it, it's, um, I think it illustrates what happens here. Uh, on any given day. You see that right. in not only our care venues, but our culinary venues. You see it amongst our facilities team. Um, but I, I think you also see it in dealing with larger problems. If we're talking about the pandemic and having a, uh, a cross um, divisional team, if you will, okay. um, and having multi-function uh, people within that, supporting that, that effort uh, and allowing for different input, it, it really does make a difference. Um, and we do that so frequently here. And I think sometimes people uh, uh, take it for granted, which um, you know, I can tell you in a lot of organizations they try, I think here we do a really good job of trying to be inclusive of voices and, and include different positions. So. Um, so talk a little bit more about those other initiatives. Yeah. So um, one of the things I'll talk about what we've, what we've done this year and will continue to do that I think is really neat. Um, performance evaluations are, are, we think, very helpful. We have a system where merit increases are tied to how you score on your performance evaluation. So if somebody scores really well and has 
as we prayed here, they get a higher merit increase than someone who is, is doing okay but not doing as well. So, um, so Jeff, as you know, we, this year, yes, this year, July 1, we had a, we moved to a common evaluation day because as good as they are, what was happening is that they were late. Supervisors, and, and for those of you who, who worked in, in ran businesses and know, um, you never have time to do performance evaluations. There's never a time, and you just have to make the time to do it. Um, but how to really discourage someone is not to do it or to do it late, especially when the pay raises are tied to it. So while I think we had a good evaluation and, and the feedback that was given I think was, was positive and good, it turned into a, something that discouraged as opposed to encouraged. So we did a lot of work and this July 1, we have a common evaluation date and everyone got a performance evaluation on time. And while you think, yeah, of course, it had never been done, certainly not in the 10 years that, that I've been here. And in the 10 years that I've been here, we've heard feedback every one of those 10 years is that I didn't get it on time, or where is it, or can you help me get it, and, and you know, can you speak to my supervisor for me? And this year, um, we did it. So again, something, okay, well, we're gonna switch a lot of things behind the scenes to do that and continue to do that. Um, another initiative is not nearly um, as impressive or, or sounds good, but one of the things we're doing is we're revising and looking at all of the HR policies and, um, and the handbook. So one of the things that we're doing, first of all, they need updated. Some of them are very old um, and some of them are new. But we're also preparing ourselves for the future. So as LSMDs, you know, what will we be in five years? What will we be in 10 years? And will we have two communities? Maybe. Might we have other ways to serve? Maybe. And to spread our mission? Maybe. But we need to get those in place, um, and they are for both communities, of course, but we need to get those in place in case there are opportunities for the future. So not all that exciting, but a big deal. And I can tell you, when, when we started that process, um, and, and all of our departments are, are doing that at this point, um, it, it's not at the top of everyone's list of favorite things to do, as you can imagine. Uh, reading through policy is sometimes challenging, but um, one of the things that we learned at the beginning of the pandemic, for instance, is we had pandemic policy. We had policies on infectious diseases. Uh, but all of that, even though it's reviewed on an annual basis, many of them, I should say, are reviewed right. on an annual basis, um, there is always new research, um, just like now with the pandemic oh, and, sure. and lessons learned. And I, I think HR is, is very similar, whether it's the HR law or just yes. change of practice, quite honestly. Uh, and, and that can come to just social socializing changing, oh, right. and right. socialization is changing, and business is changing as a whole. And, it's a very different climate, as I would, as I would say right now. And exciting. I, I'm like an odd person because I find the flow and thought like really, really interesting. Yes. Yeah. And, we, and thankfully, we have great resources outside of the organization, yeah. too, that we yeah. work with and partner with. So, um, so let's, let's segue away from, from business because people want to get to know you as well. So okay. let's go back to a little bit more about you. So how do you spend your spare time? Uh -huh. um, so we are very fortunate, and I still don't know how we do this, but we have lots of friends, and um, we're lucky that our sons are close by that we can spend time with them. But we have lots of different friends, and we spend time with them. I love to cook, and so we often go to each other's homes and and, um, and spend time there. We, um, I mentioned Macy, taking Macy on long hikes, and we like to do that over the weekend. Uh, we like to bicycle, so we will cycle some of the rail trails. Um, my husband is preparing for he and some of his friends, I don't go along with this, they ride their bicycles from Cumberland to Pittsburgh every year. And, um, and he's five years older than me, as are his, his friends, so they're doing it in their late 60s. So they take a few years to do, um, I'm sorry, a few days to do it. How many miles is that? A lot, I don't know, like 160 or something, I think. So, um, or more, anyway. It take, they, they do it over three days, so um, it's not that strenuous. But that first day up the mountain 
is a big one. They go from Cumberland up to the um, Eastern Continent or Divide, so it's a, it's a big day. So but we like to, I don't do that, but we like to disciple. Um, and as, as you suggested, we are, um, we are a family who, um, I would say sports enthusiasts, but that doesn't go into, we watch lots and lots of sports. And um, so there's soccer and there's football and there's basketball and there's tennis. And now during the pandemic, Formula One racing, and I do not know why, but our younger son um, started watching that and Spencer apparently has been watching it and listening to it because somehow he did not have TV until the late 70s, so it's almost done, but listening to on the radio. So, um, and believe it or not, my son and my husband are in a fantasy league for Formula One racing. I know, who knows? I have no idea. So we, um, we spend too, way too much time following these and um, my two sons, uh, British Premier Soccer, we talk about the English Premiership. Um, they have opposing teams, so one loves Manchester United, one loves Liverpool, and there's some lots of discussions about that. But we, um, we spend a lot of time watching that, too much time, but enjoy it. And of course, Tennessee. And so college, I, you know, I um, the, the sort of joke is, is when I watch Tennessee football, I only eat orange food and I only drink orange drinks. And, um, and hopefully it's not too inappropriate, but don't knock um, orange knee-high soft, um, soft drink with vanilla vodka until you feel like <laughs> Nothing's inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing so so carrot, cheeses, I have orange little dishes, I really go over the top. <laughs> You know, one of the things that, uh, that I learned about Susie very early on is that you can ask her about any sporting event. Yeah. She has an answer. She has watched it, seen yeah. some of it, yeah. seen the highlights of it, um, which if you're into sports, it makes it really fun to talk to Susie like I am. Uh, but if you're trying to get to know Susie, if you're at an event and you haven't met Susie, that's a great icebreaker for her because just about any sport you may be into, but she's paid it. So. I want golf. I think I'm golf. Golf too. Here we go. Yeah. We had a recent discussion about the Ryder exactly. Cup. So. Exactly. And I'm not much of a golfer. I don't want anyone to oh, get no, the wrong yeah. idea, but I was very, uh, very into watching the Ryder Cup and rooting for the United States. Um, so, do you have any hobbies? Um, yeah, I think we just covered them. Yeah, it's. Well, yeah, right. So, um, so cooking, like to cook, like to entertain, like to bicycle. Like to go on hikes, like to watch everything. Not building anything or no birdhouses in your backyard. Or yeah, well, it's like interesting. Well, we like many, um, many people. So we in Carroll County, we live on a wooded lot, which is nice. And so like many people during the pandemic, now we're looking outside and should we build on another structure? So we're thinking about it, should we get a new porch? And then we, we started to research Every, like everyone else in the nation, is also thinking about street and porches. So finding a contractor to do that has been more difficult than, than we thought. So, um, so yes, thinking about doing some things to the house and improving outside living. So what's on your bucket list? I have a long bucket list. Really? So um, one of Spencer's brothers lives in New Zealand on the North Island, Island of New Zealand. I have not been, Spencer has visited years ago. So. Um, so certainly New Zealand, a couple of years ago, did the um, Alaskan cruise, like many I know residents have, and that was big fun. So um, New Zealand, on the bucket list is 2026 Winter Olympics in Italy, because Italy is a bucket list, and, um, and sports crazy, we really want to see both the Olympics have this sign. I think actually 2028 Summer Olympics is in LA, I think, but I so there's a Summer Olympics in the States. Um, we want to travel. We'd like to drive across the United States, take a train across Canada, um, do Europe um, and the UK. So do that um, one day, we should probably do it soon. Um, some women friends and I want to go to Lake Placid where they had the, Lake Placid, New York, had the Olympics years ago. And you can do the bobsled like you can actually do 
So we want to do that. I'm not sure about the news, but certainly the bobsled we want to do. So mostly travel. Now I saw a, a bobsled that's done in Switzerland. Oh. I saw it on, on some, some uh, media uh, that actually showed a form of bobsled that they still use the track. They could ride a bobsled down any time of the year. Oh, no. oh okay. Yeah, it was it was pretty neat. It's all open, here. so you can see all of the Alps along the way. Okay. Yeah. That I don't know how fast it goes, but it sounds neat. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know if they go as obviously not as fast as they do at the Olympics, but I think it would be great, great fun. So where do you like to go when you go out to eat? So, well, during the last year and a half, we've um, only eaten out in probably just the last few months and places outside. But we like to do um, local places. We like Mediterranean, we like Paradiso. Um, we like the, um, oh shoot, what's the place on Main Street is um, seafood. Yes, Vauxhall, thank you. Um, rock salt, we like um, Papa Joe's for, um, uh, for Mexicans, yeah, so different places. We like, we have friends who live in Frederick, friends who live downtown in Baltimore, so we like to go there too, but recently, of course, only outside places. And I know, I know during the pandemic, Susie and I talked a lot about trying to support our local restaurants, and um, I know the two of us were, were doing a lot of takeout at yeah. times just to have something different and not cook at home. Mm -hmm. um, and also here here at uh, the community at Carol Weaver Village and at Weaver Village and Village Bank, we tried to order in from uh, restaurants that were local yes. um, as really team building um, occasions for, for our team and um, tried to support them along the way as well. And, and um, it, I think in both areas, those restaurants were, were very happy that, okay. that we were trying to partner with them and, and try to keep it going on an ongoing basis. And, um, and so that's been a wonderful relationship that we've been able to develop over time. But I, I think probably many of our residents did the same. Yes. So what have we missed? I don't know. What have we missed? Um, what should we share that we haven't shared? Is there anything that we forgot? I mean, one thing that we talk about initiatives that um, I haven't actually started quite yet, but we're going to, um, that Jeff and I have been talking about is succession planning. So um, you, you look at, Jeff's of course young, but you look at me, you look at some other members of the leadership team, and, um, and while we have, I don't think any of us have plans to go anywhere for a while, um, it would also, we would be remiss if we would not look towards the future. So while um, in HR, succession planning is considered one of the most important things and something that is rarely done well. So one of the things that Jeff and I have been talking about is how can we you know, prepare, say, for you know, five years or 10 years or even out, how can we develop great team members who might be in, um, in middle management, if you will, positions, or maybe not even in leadership positions, and what can we do now to prepare them? So that means leadership development classes and looking for, you know, say this person, what are they missing? Maybe they need to have more training or education, or maybe just exposure to something. Maybe they um, aren't in a supervisory role, but maybe they could lead up a project. So one of the things that we'll be um, looking for towards doing is that. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll add one other component to that is that I think we're also evaluating um, our roles to understand has the role changed over time. Um, and, and some of you may have picked up on this earlier that um, when Susie joined uh, this organization, it was Carol Weaver Village alone. And so she's transitioned over to Weaver Social Ministries and so in essence, her job has changed quite a bit over the years, believe it or not, um, and, and we expect it to continue to grow, not just with, with potential growth, but just the evolution of our business and the needs of our team members and, and supporting that. Um, so we anticipate other positions to be in the same light and, and we'll have to continue to evaluate those as we go forward, um, as well as evaluating our team and, and identifying those opportunities to, to help them improve their position and potentially step into those roles. 
And when we speak about retention, that's a huge part of it, being able to give people opportunities that um, obviously we can't make promises that will be promoted into this role, but helping them gain new skills so that they're ready, that's a great way to retain. And, and I'll tell you, you know, every time this conversation comes up, it's always a, a really uh, well thought out discussion, and, and I appreciate that about Susie, because everything is. Um, however, it's one of those things where my stomach sinks a little bit every time. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, um, after I've been here a little bit over two years now, and, uh, and, and some of the vice presidents that are here today uh, have been through some, some very challenging times when it comes the last two okay. years and so we bonded quite a bit and so it is difficult to imagine uh, those same team members leaving us at some point here in the future uh, but I, I'm excited about no plans right yeah right. I, I, no plans right now I want to make that clear to everybody no plans right now me or anyone else I don't think we do want to plan for those sure, so. sure, um, what else have we forgotten well one thing that I um, when you talk talk about role I also serve um, in a compliance role. So we use, and I think probably some people know this, we use an outside nonprofit to help us with compliance. So FSA, Friends Service Alliance, um, again, nonprofit group, and their purpose is to help organizations like us in, um, in long-term care with their compliance um, because I'll say what they say, this field that we're in is more highly regulated than the nuclear power industry. And, um, and I'm probably not the only one who remembers um, Three Mile Island, like we are more regulated than the <laughs> nuclear power industry. So we, golly, probably long before you, maybe five, seven years ago, we contract with them to help us. So when new regulations come out, they help us. They come and help us with mock surveys and reviews of different processes. And so I serve as a compliance official, basically it's a liaison role, um, and our true compliance officer is with Fem Service Alliance. So my role is to help lead the compliance committee that we have, cross-functional compliance committee through both communities. Um, and we, on an annual basis, which I'll be doing soon, we'll be training everyone annual training in our code of integrity. So we write the code of integrity, we update the code of integrity, and then we train everyone in the organization yearly on the code of integrity. Yeah. Well, with that, I'll, I'll come to a close here so I can um, finish up, but uh, any party words for our audience? No, um, I, I hope that you you sense how exciting of a time it is at um, at CLB and Ellison. We, I I'm really excited as my team is, and, and I sense it from a lot of people that um, it's going to be a not that it's never been a great place to work and to live, but I, I think we're really um, going to be doing some fun and interesting things to make it an even better place. So thanks. Well, thank you for being a good sport today and sharing a little bit about yourself personally 